All right. Well, good morning, church. We're glad you could join us on this Palm Sunday this morning. And um, I did have a couple things I just wanted before we get to our study today is next week, obviously, is Easter Resurrection Sunday. And we uh, are hopefully doing our worship also. Um, and but if any questions or, or concerns, uh, we've been posting everything on Facebook. So if you have if you need to know something, you look on there or call us. Uh, feel free to call the church. Um, I if I don't answer, I will call you back. And um, to, so you know what's going on. And, and if we have anything special going on, I'll let you know that. But boy, I, I've got to be honest. It's it's a it's been a an odd time, hasn't it? I am, you know, I'm excited that we can still do online. Praise the Lord for technology in the day and age in which we live. Let's just keep praying that the Lord will see us through this, that he will sustain us. I did mention earlier this week that one thing that's really touched my heart uh, is this, the, the devotional streams in the desert. It's a classic. Uh, I've ordered a couple copies of this. If anybody would like one or if you don't have one, you can contact me and uh, but just in, in the times in which we live, uh, books like this are, devotions like this are just really meaningful. And so I encourage you to check that out. Well, <clears throat> what a special time. I, I love Palm Sunday. And I'm excited to teach a message today. So why don't I pray? And we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles... I encourage you to gather around wherever you are and turn to Luke 19, and I'll pray for us. All right. Lord, Father God, we thank you for this Palm Sunday. We thank you, Lord, that you're so good that, that we can cast uh, this message live, Lord, from the church here uh, to people all over the Skagit Valley. And so we're, we're so thankful for that, <clears throat> for the technology, Lord. I pray, Lord, that where everybody's at right now in their homes, I pray that you would just be with them, Lord. That during this time, Lord, it would be a time where you truly are meeting people and their families right where they're at, Lord, that, that people are pressing into you, Lord. I pray for our church family, that you would continue to bless them, that you would see us through this time. I, I know there's, there's not only fears of, of the coronavirus, but there's fears of... Uh, paying bills. Lord, there's fears of um, just the unknown of the future. And, and I just pray that you, Lord, would comfort us <clears throat> by your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we open up to Luke chapter 19, as we celebrate Palm Sunday today, as we, as we study your word, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to come teach us. And we just give you this time in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, today is the day that we celebrate, of course, Palm Sunday. And it, it's literally the, the, the time uh, where Jesus, he made his way to Jerusalem on his way to the cross. And really, instead of Palm Sunday, it should be called Jesus' Triumphal Entry. You know, it's this event that, that took place before <clears throat> Jesus went to the cross. Now, right before Jesus' Triumphal Entry, Jesus spoke a word, and it was a, a revelation uh, amazing revelation of, of really Jesus' mission to the world. And it's found in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And I wanted to start there this morning. In verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. This was Jesus' mission to the world. He came to seek and save the lost. Now, question, what does it mean to be lost? Well, it means you don't know how to get somewhere, essentially, right? You don't know where you are. It means that uh, maybe you're living without hope in this life. It means that you're living a life alienated from God and the life of God. Maybe you're blinded. You, you, you don't know where you're going. Well, when you're lost, you, you in, in the biblical sense... It's that you don't know Jesus. And what's interesting is a person can be lost without even knowing it. 
Have you ever been traveling and you're thinking you're going in the right direction, but you're not? You're, you're going in the wrong direction to the place you're trying to go. And you're cruising along. You think you, think you know where you're going, but you're never going to get there if you're on the wrong road. You ever have a GPS kind of give you the wrong directions? A GPS maybe uh, taking you the long way around? I remember my dad, when he was really sick and he was dying of cancer, and, and I got a call. I was in eastern Washington for some business, and I got a call to... I was going to go try to visit him, and, and, and so I, I didn't know the area very well, and, and I, I missed one sign to turn there, and it ended up taking a lot longer than I thought because I had to go the long way around, and just that, that one little turn that I missed, that one sign I wasn't paying attention to. And I wonder how many people right now are cruising along thinking that they're going to get to heaven because of their religious affiliation or I'm a member of this church or that church. And, and yet in reality, they have no clue that they're lost. Remember my son Jedediah, he it got lost a few times and he didn't know he was lost. <laughs> he, he just kind of was, was a kid who kind of wandered off sometimes and and one time, you know, a couple times, you know, he's nowhere to be found. And it can be scary. You know, he didn't, wasn't thinking it was scary. He didn't think he was lost. One time we were uh, in Seattle and uh, there was this kind of out, covered outdoor escalator. And uh, we were talking to some people and he happened to think this was kind of cool. And so we got in the escalator and the escalator went down and it, and, and it went the, the sidewalk went outside and onto this really busy street. And, and, and one, the, the moment we look, he's on the escalator going down. And we're like, stop, you know. So you know, he didn't know that there was danger in it. And I wonder how many people are in our world today in, 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 in the same sense spiritually. You know, the Bible tells us that people are spiritually asleep. Asleep spiritually, they're lost in their sin, and, and they don't even realize it. You know, if you think about the effects of being lost, is, is, is spiritually speaking, biblically speaking, it's when you don't know Jesus. Now, a lot of people say they, they know Jesus, but I've said this many times before, does Jesus know you? Does Jesus know you? You don't want to be lost when you, and stand before God someday. You know, Jesus said in the Gospels, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me. In other words, I don't know who you are. You're a stranger. Now, I know that sounds scary for some people or even maybe stressful to be lost. But here's the awesome truth, okay? Nobody has to be lost. Nobody. Nobody has to be lost. Why? Because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And this is the essence of why Jesus came. He, Jesus came to save lost people. He, he, he wants to have a living relationship with us. He wants to be involved in our everyday lives. He wants to be at home in us. And when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't because of some tragic misunderstanding between the Jewish leaders and, and Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for, on purpose to pay the price for our sins, that we could be forgiven. Perhaps you have yet to turn your life to Jesus. And you're not listening right here, right now, by accident. This morning. There's a great verse in Revelation, and, and Jesus, in a sense, he wants each and every person to get to know him. And he wants to know you. In Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I come into him and dine with him and he with me. Perhaps you're, you're thinking, well, I could never become a Christian because I've done terrible things in my life. And I would remind you that's exactly the kind of person Jesus is looking for. He came to save lost people. Real saving faith is more than words. It's more than appearances. Real faith produces change. He wants a change in our heart, a change in our life. And this is the test. If Jesus truly knows you, there's change. 
But, but I wanted to tell you this morning that Jesus came for you. And in verse 10, as our backdrop, I'd like to get into the Palm Sunday uh, triumphal entry this morning. Would you skip down Luke chapter 19? Stay there. Verse 28. It says, When he had said this, he went ahead going up to Jerusalem. This morning, the whole purpose, the whole point of Jesus' life boils down to this final week of, uh, of his life. This is the final mar his final march towards the, the, the only solution for the sins of the world. Your sins and my sins. Now picture this, Jerusalem. It's teeming with people. It probably they, they estimate some two million people were in Jerusalem celebrating the Passover. And on this particular day... The real Passover lamb was making his way to the altar of sacrifice. And you remember that people believed Jesus was going to Jerusalem to establish his throne militarily. Now, the final week would begin like this. Sunday, the day that we're studying right now, would, the, would be the day that Jesus publicly acknowledged that he indeed was the Messiah. Now, Jesus said it many times before. That he was the Messiah. But this is the first time that he allowed the public acknowledgement that he was the Messiah. And tomorrow on Monday, uh, we know from the Gospels that he would cleanse the temple. And then Thursday, he would be arrested. Friday, he was crucified. And Sunday, he rose again from the grave. Uh, continuing on, verse 29. And it came to pass, when he drew near Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go to the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it, bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. The disciples at this point, they also hoped that, that Jesus would inherit his throne that, that he would uh, conquer the Roman Empire. They wanted to be important. And, and now, as they approach, approach Jerusalem, he tells two of the disciples, we don't know who, which two, to go to the town and essentially steal a donkey, right? And they had, they had hopes that Jesus would, you know, th that he would rule. And they were reduced to a mission of retrieving someone else's donkey. <laughs> I find it kind of amusing. And yet, of course, this was a fulfillment of prophecy. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. You know, sometimes ministry seems very small, but in reality, it's very big. These guys thought they were just going to get a little donkey. But it was a big thing, and we're reading about it today. Now, if Jesus would have come to town on anything other than a donkey, an unwritten cold, it wouldn't have been the, the one they were waiting for. In that phrase in Zechariah, I didn't have you turn there, but it says, see your, come, your king comes to you. In other words, this is your king. This is important because it, the, you see your king comes to you. It, it literally can be like, look at, behold, Gaze upon. This is the one and true king. There's no other. You know, in other words, if they were disappointed, and we know some of them were disappointed with Jesus, it made no difference. This was the only king sent by God for them and for us. This is Jesus. Take him or not. He's the only one. And we might wonder why he knew there would be a donkey available. Uh, we might even think maybe the disciples kind of got lucky. They, they found a donkey tied up in the first place they looked. And, and yet because of this prophecy, donkeys were tied up around Jerusalem. So you couldn't miss finding a donkey. People were excited. <laughs> so donkeys were available because the Jews were waiting for this very day. And it continues on in verse 32. It says, So they were sent their way and found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosening our colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. 
And then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And he, as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Think about this crowd. They were excited. Imagine being in that crowd today. <laughs> I know uh, this last Christmas we went to the, the Bellevue Snowflake Lane and, 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 and they do the fake snow at, at the Bellevue Square uh, area and it was so packed of people. <laughs> you had to kind of peek over it just to even see the parade that was going on. And imagine doing that today, uh, you know, and then it, when we don't, we're not around crowds and stuff. But I, I can kind of picture the people like that. But this huge crowd, people kind of peeking, who is it? Who's the Messiah? Who is he? You know, it, he, they knew he was coming. And some even expected it was Jesus. But they weren't sure, many of them. I think some would have argued, well, he must be the Messiah, Jesus. Have you seen all the miracles he's done? And others were, were they didn't like his messages to, to turn the other cheek. They, they were uh, disgusted, in a sense, by his appeal to love their enemies. And I could almost picture the people betting who they thought it would be. And in this crowd, according to Matthew, it's, they're, 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 they're stirred up upon his arrival. The Greek word for stirred up, it means seismic. It's where we get the word, you know, ground shaking, earthquake, seismic. And so that's, the, that, that's the, the kind of excitement that was happening. You know, the tension in the air. Who is it? It continues on in verse 37. It says, then, as he now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice. And praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The other gospels reveal that the crowd was shouting, Hosanna. Which means save now. Hosanna, save now. See, this entire incident. was going pretty well. The people, they're happy to see Jesus as their king. The disciples must have been thinking, you know, this is going a lot better than how Jesus described it would, is going to go. And, and yet, but the, here's where we see the real problem. And people, they wanted to be saved now by the Rome and government, not from their sin. God wanted to save them from themselves. But they didn't think they needed to be. They, they were like many today who, who want to expect God to save them from the consequences of sin while allowing them to continue sinning. We, we've grown so comfortable with our sins that we fail sometimes to recognize just how disgusting our sins are to God. The real truth is people just, they don't want to stop sinning. If you think about it for a moment, honestly, Jesus says we have, come to, we have to come to him on his terms and not the other way around. We don't come to the Lord on our terms. We have to come to the Lord on his terms. Now, look, look what happens next. Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. As they were saying, Hosanna, save now. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. If they had knew, knew he was coming, why would Jesus be crying? Why was he crying? It may, literally means he's weeping. So as they're singing, save now, he continues down the road and he starts weeping. 
Why was he weeping? Because he knew that they would reject him. Because he wasn't the king that they wanted. They wanted a donkey king. <laughs> they wanted their king to, to ride in on a war horse. They wanted the sword. And they refused to understand, really, the suffering servant prophecies of the Messiah. They didn't want God to deal with their sin. They wanted him to deal with their enemy. They wanted the right to rule their own lives. They wanted to live however they wanted to live. And the problem is the reason Jesus is weeping is that God never lets people live the way they want to live. You know, Billy Graham was famous for saying that if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for the sins of our country. See, again, we have to accept him on his terms for who he is, and, or we don't accept him at all. You guys, our, our nation has been shaken. But our nation has been in sin, abortion, uh, perversions, and evils. I don't need to get into the details. But sometimes I wonder about the church, too. You know, the, the, the things we've allowed and the sins we've allowed in the church as Christians in our lives. And I, kind of, I wonder if this time of the, the, the coronavirus and COVID-19, I wonder if it's a time that the Lord is trying to purify the church. He, he's, he's, he's made us slow down our lives. He's, he's made us stop. He, he's made us pause. And, and it's a time that we have to prioritize our, our life again. You know, I wonder if for those who rejected Jesus, you know, for those who rejected Jesus, he weeps for you. He weeps for me when we reject him, when we don't live for him, when we don't obey him. What was wrong with Jesus? I mean, think about it. He spoke of peace. He's, he's, he's there literally riding lowly on a donkey. He spoke of, you know, loving people, loving your enemies. He spoke of holiness. He spoke of righteousness. He spoke of turning the other cheek, loving those that are impossible to love. You know, he's, he spoke of the necessity of turning from your sin and turning to God. That's what repentance is. He, he spoke of letting him, Jesus, be in control of our lives. And yet the people, then and now, hated him for that. Even today, uh, there, there's, we have a multitude of professing Christians who simply don't want Jesus to be king over them. Because if, if someone's king and lord over you, you have to obey them. You can't live for yourself. And yet men and women who call him lord, and yet do not do what he says. And he's crying. Because he knows the painful future ahead for all those who reject him as king. He knows the painful future. Do you realize that today? God is giving you a chance to know the things that make for peace with him. That's what Palm Sunday is about. Jesus makes peace with God possible because he died on the cross to pay for your sins. The Jewish leaders, they rejected the Messiah, but you don't have to. You don't have to. You know, the Bible says this in, in, in John 1, 12, it says, but as many as received him, received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Guys, this is a special week. One of the most important weeks for born-again believers, Easter. 
resurrection, new life, Jesus conquering death. Now, I know this might seem a little weird to some of us, okay? But I would like us to prepare ourselves, the church, for Jesus going to the cross, the, 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 you know, him resurrecting as we celebrate this week. I would like us to do this by partaking of communion. And in a moment, I, I just encourage you there at home. You might not have grape juice or a little, you know, the cracker that we usually have here. But maybe you can find some saltines or some bread and some juice or some water. Or, you know, some crackers. <laughs> you know... I want you to quiet your heart as we seek the Lord. You know, Jesus, he, he took the, the wine and the bread, the matzah. It was a symbol. It was a symbol of his body and his blood. It was just a symbol. You know, to me, communion, it, it doesn't matter what we have, but, but it's a time that we get right with the Lord. And I think is, that's what's needed this morning is for us to get right with the Lord, to allow, allow the Lord to search our hearts. And we're, so we're going to just play a song, and we're almost done. And I, as we play the song, I encourage you to go to the kitchen and, and find a cracker or find some bread, find some juice, some water if that's all you have. And we're going to partake of communion together. And so let's go ahead and play the song. And I'll be back in one moment to lead us through the communion time together. All right. That my God would welcome me into this mystery. See, take this bread, take this wine. Now the symbol may divine for any to receive. But my 